Welcome to the Harry Jackson Show this morning, this wonderful Monday morning in July, July 1st. I'm Pastor Dave Parlett filling in for Bishop Jackson this morning, and we're going to have an awesome show today. I'm joined in the studio with a great guest, Pastor Matt Anderson of Missing Peace Productions. Good morning to you, Matt. Good, Good morning, Pastor Dave. How are you? Great. We're doing awesome today. And we're going to be dealing with a lot of issues, particularly a touchy subject on racism. Is it really dead? We're going to discuss everything from the Paula Dean scandal to what happened with affirmative action last week right here at the Supreme Court down the street in Washington, D.C. So we want to hear from you this morning. Uh, post your comments on Facebook and uh, you can go to at at Harry at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show. We'll respond to you on there at Twitter or Facebook.com forward slash the Harry Jackson Show. And uh, we're listening here to the Harry Jackson Show at the UrbanFamilyTalk.com. You can check us out on the web. So it's going to be a great show today. Also, a little bit later, we're going to be joined by social commentator Raynard Jackson. So uh, we hope you had a great weekend. And uh, in church, hopefully you took your family there and spent family time together as we know so well that it is so important as we're raising our kids in today's culture, particularly the theme today is cultural wars, and uh, we have to stand and teach our kids and teach our family the truth. So we're looking at a couple top-of-the-news articles today, Uh, a real crisis here in Arizona. We're reading Uh, A very unfortunate situation, Uh, 19 firefighters were killed in an Arizona wildfire. It was a lightning strike, and this elite team of 19 firefighters were killed Sunday, yesterday, as they tried to protect themselves under a fire-resistant shield. This has been a very fast-moving wildfire, and uh, the authorities believe it began about 90 miles northwest of Phoenix on Friday as a lightning strike. It spread to at least 2,000 acres. And, uh, of course, we've heard the heat wave that is there in that western part of the nation, triple-digit temperatures, uh, well over 120 degrees in some parts and even higher, and very low humidity, windy conditions. And uh, so now that fire that started with 2,000 acres has tripled in size to 6,000 acres, and uh, there are 18 victims. So it's, it's been uh, a horrible situation, and we uh, will stop for a moment and pray even for those folks. But, uh, uh, Pastor Madden, any, any thoughts, and maybe we'll have you pray here in just a moment for them uh, about this even this crisis uh, here in Arizona? Well, my first thought is is with the families of those who've lost uh, those 19 people, their fathers, their husbands, their family members. uh, People are concerned about their sons. These are first responders. Many times we, you know, don't think twice about people who are rushing to a fire or to some sort of immediate emergency. But these are the folks who are out here on the front line of wildfires. Not only are they protecting you know, property, but they're also protecting lives as well. And they put their own lives uh, in harm's way. And they don't get a, it's not really, they don't do it for money. They do it because they love what they do. They're trying to save lives and property. So my first thought is really for the families. And secondly, it's to appreciate what it is that they do to really put their lives on the line for other people. So as first responders, it just makes me think about how we are as the church to be first responders as well. When people are in crisis, to help them uh, be encouraged through difficult times like this at, at a time of loss. Well, it says this particular team of men were called the hot shots, the, the mm-hmm. elite firefighters. They hiked for miles into the wilderness uh, with their chainsaws, backpacks, filled with very heavy gear and uh, to remove the brush and trees. And, of course, they were caught uh, and their lives were lost. So um, if you would, go ahead and, and pray a brief prayer even now. We need to remember them in our prayers, their families, as you said. Father God, we thank you for the service of these 19 firefighters, Lord. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their legacies. We thank you for the influence that they had on their communities. We thank you for their selflessness, Lord. We pray for your spirit 
your holy comforter to come and touch the families of those who have been lost, to encourage that community, Lord God, even in their time of loss. We pray that we learn something from the midst of their selfless acts, Lord God, even sacrificing their own lives. We're reminded that no greater love than a person could give than to give up their lives for their brother. And we thank you for this example that they've set. And meanwhile, Lord God, we'll continue to learn from this example, try to apply their principles to our lives so we can be better examples of who Christ is in this generation. It's in Jesus' name we thank you and we pray. Amen. Mm. Thank you for that prayer. We need to remember them. They've got a a long ways to go. Uh, They have not even begun to contain this wildfire. Well, a second article here in the news, and uh, it deals with atheism. Uh, Atheists have unveiled a monument Mm. near the Ten Commandments down in Florida. (laughs) So a group of atheists unveiled a monument to their non-belief in God. And they did that this weekend on Saturday uh, to sit alongside a granite slab uh, that lists the Ten Commandments in front of Bradford County Courthouse. Now, I'm looking at a picture, and it looks like uh, a picture of what we would see in a science class of an atom. And uh, you you see the atom and the neutron, Mm -hmm. and they've got the big letter A Mm -hmm. in the middle uh, etched in granite, and you've got an elderly lady there with a big smile on her face. She is so happy that she doesn't believe in God. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We've come so far. God has not only created us, and he's given us this great country that we live in, but now uh, we have people, as we've had historically throughout the history of mankind, they're promoting their non-belief in God, And now they've created even a monument to their non-belief in God. It says a small group of protesters, uh, which have been on the Christian side, they blasted Christian country music. And uh, they were saying, uh, you know, they love Jesus uh, right by this monument. So when you look at this monument, the first thing you notice is that it has a function. Atheists are about the real and the physical. So we selected this place, quote, uh, as a monument in the form of a bench, says the president of the American atheist, David Silverman. And it also serves another function. So now they have a place to sit. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? That promotes atheism. But it is counter to the religious movement that the New Jersey-based group wanted removed. It's a case of if you can't beat them, Join them. So the American atheist sued to try to have the stone slab of the Ten Commandments taken away from the courthouse lawn uh, from the conservative North Florida town, best known for the uh, prison that confines death row inmates. My, but the uh, the community men's fellowship erected the monument in what's described as free speech zone, and uh, the atheist group was told that it could have its own monument too. We're not going to let them do it without a counterpoint, Silverman said. So if we do it without counterpoint, it's going to appear very strongly that the government actually endorses one religion over another. I should say religion in general or, quote, non-religion. So do you have a, a, a thought on what in the world causes people to fight against such a gracious, wonderful God who has given us so much and they have to proclaim their you know, non this, this, this makes me think of a, a great illustration. It's like playing the air guitar. It's going through the motions, but there's really no music coming out. <laughs> it's real oxymoron. I mean, it's a monument to, you know, their non-belief. I mean, it's, it's, it's hilarious to me. I mean, it, it would be almost comical if it weren't so tragic that all of these yeah. souls that they're leading down the, yes. the path to destruction, you know, is, is really what they're doing. It makes me think about, you know, if they have a bench right next to the actual monument there, which is actually part of the monument, and they've got quotes from Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Madeline Mary O'Hare, the founder of the American Atheist. But it just really makes me think about, you know, how they're becoming their own gods. You know, they have a non-belief, and they want to believe in the tangible, the real, but of course the real only comes out of the unseen. And, uh, you know... It also makes me think about a quote from uh, uh, Aleister Crowley, you know, one of the wickedest man alive, where yes. he said, uh, he said, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That really is the foundation of all that he believed in his, his Satanism. And, and to some degree, I believe that atheism is a borderline form of 
uh, guised Satanism, if you will. You know, I just believe that, you know, their unbelief is really a gateway. It's almost like a gateway drug. You know, like some people say marijuana is a gateway drug to heavier drugs. It's almost it like is, yeah. that, that void leaves a, an open place for unclean or, or foul spirits to come in. So, yeah, I think it's tragic, you know, this, this situation. It's very tragic. And Madeline Murray O'Hare really repented and uh, came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. It'd be nice if they also put that in quotes. How about that? Uh, as well, but they're going to take, they're going to promote ungodliness. They're on the fast track to, um, well, you, you hate to say on, on the air, but you, the fast track to hell. Well, uh, we, we don't talk about that that much. But, but you know, really, hell is the, the opposite of he- heaven is the home mm-hmm. of God. It's mm-hmm. the home of Jesus. So mm-hmm. Jesus basically saying, if you love me, I want you to live with me in heaven. But so many people believe they're going to go to heaven regardless, but they don't want to live with Jesus here on the earth. So let's fight God, and then we think God wants us to live with him for eternity. So this is another place that God is not uh, having his blessing or his grace or his mercy or his love. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so they're on a fast track in the wrong place, the wrong direction. It's also interesting to me that they, you know, quote Thomas Jefferson, who was a famed deist. You mm-hmm. know, he believed in God, uh, but he believed that God took his hands off of the affairs of man after yes, he created he us. You know, he even actually has his own uh, Bible where he took out the, the miracles and the those miracles. Kind of things. Yes. So I, I think it's fascinating where we begin, become our own gods until it becomes difficult. And most people... Well, I don't want to say most people. A lot of people come to the saving uh, a grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ in the time of trauma, when they get to the end of themselves. I, I've heard of one of the stories of a traveling evangelist where she was sitting next to an atheist nonbeliever, and the plane she, plane was falling, and it fell a good 5,000 feet. And uh, the woman said, I don't want to hear you talk about God. And then the first <laughs> thing she screamed out when the plane was falling was, oh, God. Right. <laughs> And so we realize somewhere inherently there's there's this mm-hmm. this heart shaped empty place that only Jesus can fit. There, and, there, and so we, we we thank God. Yes. No atheists in foxholes. No. <laughs> we have our final final article here today. Millions stand at vigil to honor Nelson Mandela's legacy. Millions all over the world are really preparing uh, for. Uh, what Nelson Mandela uh, has done, they simply want to honor him. Uh, he is lingering right now, as we know, in a hospital there uh, in South Africa. Yet they know that his legacy has been sealed. Uh, he spent those 27 years in prison forgiving those who tortured him. What amazing, amazing man and uh, very, very rare man. So maybe you might have a a closing thought on this, Pastor Matt. Wow. Uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, to go from prison to the presidency is just fascinating. I remember clearly when he walked out of prison watching TV live when he w- came out of prison after all those years in prison. And it's just amazing to me to think that at one time he was literally a, a boxer. That's what he did before he went to prison in addition to his political activities. And still here he is, uh, you know, in the twilight of his life, still a fighter. And I just think that there's a, a real sense of uh, honor and reverence that we should give to the man while he can smell his flowers. I think it's an important time for us to be able to appreciate him for all the work he's done. When today here in America, our heroes tend to be sports figures. They tend to be entertainers. Uh, we don't really even reverence, you know, uh, scientists, uh, you know, and politicians tend to get some reverence as well. But it's, it'd be great to see someone like this who really is concerned about the least of these. So, so my respect to, you know, President Nelson Mandela, former President Nelson Mandela. Right, and we're to honor him, as you are saying, while he is still alive. Uh, we know that uh, death is always inevitable for everyone. As, as he's saying, he's probably meditating and thinking about even what will eternity look like for him. Has he done everything he was created to do? What an amazing man, uh, as, uh, as he has forgiven those if we could only come to that stage for the rest of us, that we can forgive those who have hurt us. Uh, so many people carry so many wounds, and their goal are to get revenge, to get back. Uh, they're going to be the judge and jury, where really the best and the easiest way is to forgive those who have wounded us. And Nelson Mandela is certainly one of those role models that we see in our day and our age. Sure. And uh, he is... He is lingering in the hospital, so we want to remember him. 
Uh, millions all over the world are gathering together to honor this 94-year-old man's uh, life and legacy. Well, we've just got a few seconds left before we come up to a break, so we want to remind you today that we're listening to Harry Jackson's show on the Urban Family Talk Network, and uh, we have with us Pastor Matt and Raynard Jackson will be joining us in a moment for our major theme dealing with racism, is it dead? With today's Faith to Action commentary, here's Janet Porter. They trampled on voters and the sacred institution of marriage. That's what the Supreme Court did in their decisions on the two marriage cases announced last week. Despite the efforts of the people who work so hard to defend the marriage amendment in California, many of them at great personal cost, the court declared that they had no standing to act on the state's behalf. In doing so, they have trampled on the rights of the 7 million voters who approved the amendment five years ago. While it's good that the court is now allowing other states to set their own laws, they trampled on the institution of marriage and all those who support it in striking down much of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Now more than ever, we need to make the case for marriage and work to defend it. Find out how at F2A.org. Visit F2A.org for more commentaries and action steps, along with news, links, and much more for your state. Go to F, the number two, A.org. Imagine someone going to incredible lengths to purchase an awesome gift for you. The gift is put into a package and delivered to your home. You look at the package and wonder what it could be. You learn that it is an awesome gift, but you don't know exactly what it is. You become very curious, but the package just sits there because you never open it. We could probably agree that the person receiving that gift did not display much gratitude or thanks. God has purchased the gift of eternal life at great personal cost. He has sent that gift to each of us and failing to open and use that gift is the worst kind of ingratitude to God. We invite you to open that eternal gift now. Ask God to come into your life, forgive your sins, and make you the kind of person He wants you to be. For help in opening that gift, call 888-NEED-HIM. That's 888-NEED-HIM. Or click over to chataboutjesus.com. And don't forget to thank God for His gift. Let's be honest, we would never want anyone to know that we've had thoughts about the evil things we would do if we were put in certain situations. I've had those same thoughts over the years, and one day I found myself in a situation where I thought I'd have to pull from those ugly thoughts and make good on my alter ego promises. My daughter and I witnessed a case of domestic dispute recently. I held my breath with anticipation that the argument would escalate to a physical confrontation. I had my finger poised to dial 911, and I seemed not to breathe at all until I looked up and saw that the woman had driven off, leaving him standing there speechless and a little dumbfounded. It reminded me that that's how the Holy Spirit had worked in me. He shut my mouth and left me dumbfounded at how he was working on my behalf in a similar situation. The Holy Spirit is designed to be your helper. Let him help. I'm Tony Johnson with a heart for today's Urban Woman. Learn more at UrbanFamilyTalk.com. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show, and with me today in the studio is Pastor Matt Anderson, as well as in a moment we'll be introducing Mr. Raynard Jackson, who'll be calling in on the line, but our topic and theme today is racism dead. And So historically today in history, 150 years ago today, began the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, and of course we remember and know that was over race and racism, and still the battle continues to rage today, or does it? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. And uh, in the studio, Pastor Matt Anderson is a media producer. He's a marketplace minister. He's got 30 years' experience in radio and television, and he's most noted for his work on Christian radio in several major media outlets, including CBS Radio One, Salem Communications, and uh, currently he's serving as a talking ima imaging, he serves as a talk imaging producer, there we go, on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. And he began serving in ministry back in 1997 as founder of Grace and Truth Ministries as an evangelistic outreach 
uh, we know, and it's very important, that's why you're a guest here today, uh, is that you engage in contemporary culture, and uh, you're right here at the intersection of media and ministry, both. So we welcome you and thank you for joining us during that first section and that segment of our program. How are you today? Outstanding. So uh, we're ready to talk about these issues of racism, and I'm going to also introduce on the line, we have Mr. Raynard Jackson, uh, who is with us. Raynard is president, CEO of Raynard Jackson Associates, uh, government relations, political consulting firm right here in D.C., and he has a great track record of balancing public policy with fundamental freedoms right here in this free market capitalistic society that we live in. He's been on the TV shows like Larry King, Gordon Liddy, Rush Limbaugh, CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox News, Black Entertainment Television, and so many areas. We, uh, we thank the Lord for Raynard Jackson. Mr. Raynard Jackson, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning to you, and uh, we're very thankful you're with us. We're going to begin with this first talking point today with the Paula Dean story. And uh, I'll be asking you a question here. There's so many places that we can go uh, dealing with racism today. Is it dead? But let's try to break down this recent item in the news for our listeners. So first up, we're talking about the Paula Dean scandal. And uh, it's got many twists, many turns to uh, what she is fighting and battling even for her career. And, of course, her famous words were, of course... I've used the the N word. So this story, Reynard, can you tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about what's all the hubbub about, and what did this cookbook Maven really do? Well, I, I got kind of a different take on this issue than what you hear in the public uh, arena so far. Number one, the first rule of PR is when you put your foot in your mouth, keep it there, shut up. That's the first thing, mm-hmm. and. I think her biggest problem was you can recover from a mistake and say something stupid, but when if you find a person constantly apologizing, you know, day to day to day, they're losing the battle. If you want to have your client apologize, you have to wait on the right moment strategically, have them say something substantively, and then go away. Shut, shut up. And every day she was out there on YouTube, and she canceled the NBC appearance, and she went on NBC. And then when she was on NBC the other day, she started talking about, well, let whoever is uh, is blameless, let them pick up the first stone and hit you upside the head. Well, you Mm -hmm. know what? Most people wanted to take that stone and hit you upside the head. And so she... Everything you could do wrong from a PR perspective, she's done it. Now, what, now the interesting take I have on this is, isn't it is amazing, especially with me working with a lot of uh, Hollywood entertainers and, and professional athletes, we are in mixed audiences, and I will hear these guys talking like they're in a locker room using the N-word and all kind of other words. Isn't it amazing that, we in the black community, we want to get that out of shape when a white person uses the word, but when we use it among ourselves and within a mixed audience, then it's a sin, and you know we want to try and feather someone. So I think it's kind of hypocritic of us to to hold other folks to a standard that we don't uphold ourselves. So I'm kind of torn on this issue, and then finally. To be honest with you, I don't think when a person messes up like she did, she should be forced off the air. I think the ultimate uh, side of uh, uh, non-support is when you stop buying her products like a lot of people have begun to do. So let her stay on the air and let the ratings drop, and then corporate America will make their decision. All right. We know, it's, of course, it is about business, and uh, she has a tremendous amount of supporters behind her, but I think we're going to agree with you on that. That way, they she she could help a lot of folks if they let her uh, continue. But we're going to turn this question to Matt and, uh, and and thank you for your sharing on that. But Matthew, the reports that her multi-million-dollar empire 
may be crumbling. Certainly, it's been impacted by her firing. Walmart, we know, won't carry her products. QVC's banned her from their airwaves. Uh, Amazon's not going to sell her wonderful cookbooks that promote fatness, right? I mean, we're, we're dealing with a whole lot of butter here in her cooking. And uh, her publishers dropped her. Uh, and we know she's going to she's gonna make her way through somehow. But uh, what else could possibly go wrong for Paula at this stage? Well, I think there's definitely going to be an impact on her $17 million per year income. I mean, we're already seeing that as some of the advertisers start to fall away. Uh, and branding, imaging is essential. I mean, people hire... Uh, prominent names, whether it's sports figures or actors or pitch people because of the image that they present in alignment with their products or services. Well, she is her brand. So that really kind of hurts hurts her tremendously. Uh, but I, I'm concerned about, you know, not just the word. Yes, she can be forgiven for, you know, saying the word one time or a few times even. But the, the, the deeper issue for me is having read the deposition this weekend, it goes a lot deeper when she talks about a quote, I want a true Southern plantation style wedding. Uh, wh well, I'll tell you, uh, it would really be like a bunch of little ends to wear long sleeve white shirts, black shorts, and black bow ties. You know, in the Shirley Temple days, they oh. used to tap dance around, end quote. Well, that says to me an institutionalized form of, of racism that goes back further. I even saw an, an interview where she talked about, you know, with more of those crocodile teals about her great grandfather, who at the end of the Civil War, uh, you know, lost all of those quote unquote workers who were on his books, and he just didn't know what to do with himself because his son had also been lost in the Civil War, uh, obviously fighting for the Confederacy. And so he was upset having lost his son, lost his workers, and so he killed himself. Well, where did her wealth come from? Obviously, three, four generations later, she's reaping the benefits, some of that, uh, uh, some of the slave labor, the free labor that uh, obviously trickled down to her $17 million. Uh, a, a year income. Now, that's not saying that's directly from it, but of course she's making you know brands and those kinds of things. But can it get worse? Yes, it can get worse. Uh, but I think that there's we've already seen a tremendous outpouring, uh, even from folks in the African American community who said, "I'll continue to visit her restaurants. I'll buy her sauces and 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 you know uh, you know home make items or you know homemaker type items." So I, I'm just you know, for me, I just think we're kind of. We're kind of being, you know, hypocritical when we say, oh, she said the N-word, but we go out and spend fifteen ninety nine to buy a CD to be called the N-word you know, yeah, amongst ourselves. Yeah, we, yeah, we do. So that's a little silly to me. It, it, there's certainly mixed signals that are being sent across. And one of the questions, is she really crying crocodile tears or is there true repentance? Yeah, I, I saw her, you know, on, on the show with Matt Lauer. Not one tear. They zoomed in really tight. I didn't see one tear. That's not to say she wasn't sincere. Yeah. Uh, you know, can she be forgiven? Absolutely. I'm sure she's trying to, you know, salvage her income and her businesses and maintain her brand and, her, and those kinds of things. But what about, you know, the grease man when he talked about, you know, oh, MLK, well, you know, he was assassinated. Maybe we'll assass assassinate six more. We'll get a whole week off. Well, he was, you know, inevitably put off of the air. The same thing with Don Imus talking about nappy-headed so-and-so yeah, yeah, for yeah. a women's basketball team. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's doing pretty well, actually, now with his nationally syndicated radio and television show. Just shifted and re repackaged himself. But he's still Don Imus. Well, well Raynard, let, let's ask you, because we're talking about some others that have bounced back. What, what do you think? Do you think she can bounce back? Is the damage too severe for her? Well, yeah, here's what I find interesting when... They, and we know who they are, they can always bounce back, but rarely, rarely do you see one of us making similar types of mistakes and they bounce back. Now, let me tell you one recent example of a client and a dear friend of mine, the actor Isaiah Washington, who used to be on Great Anatomy. He got in trouble with the homosexual community over some crazy stuff. And now he's not a fact, but he is an anomaly, especially in Hollywood. When you are black and you go through a incident like the Paula Dean or someone like that, rarely do we get that second chance. But it's common. I mean, you look at uh, Spitzer, the former governor of New York. He he gets a political scandal, gets a TV show. You get the um, the former governor of New Jersey. Uh, his name slips me on, who was caught up in the homosexual stuff. He gets a TV show. But when you look at some of our guys, you know, politicians, when they get caught in a scandal, you never hear from them again. 
in any in a public forum type situation. You got this guy Weiner who was showing all these racy pictures and resigned from the house, and now he's running for mayor of New York. And so, on the redemption side, we typically never get that second chance. Uh, from the public perspective and from the commercial side of now within our community, a lot of times we'll forgive our own, but as far as the, the business opportunity side, we rarely get that second chance. Well, well Matt, and, and you're a media guru, we've got a couple moments left here in this segment. Do you think that the public humiliation uh, like this really, is is this the way to go to humiliate this woman? Is this going to solve anything? Well, I think the public, by and large, is looking for, you know, like you said, repentance. And they, of course, don't use that word. But, you know, for, when they ask for forgiveness, they want to see sincerity. Uh, that, I think that's by and large. I think the American public tends to be a forgiving public. And, and I have to agree, you know, with Reynard that, you know, you very rarely see, you know, African-Americans recover from, you know, major faux pas like this, with the exception of maybe Reverend Jesse Jackson when he made the, the Jaime Town comment about New York, and forgive me, my Jewish brothers and sisters, that's just quoting what he said. But he was able to recover from that years later. And with even some of his sexual impropriety, he was able to recover to some degree, uh, some would say. So, But I, I think that, you know, that she can recover from this, and is the humiliation the way to do it? I mean, people to some degree want to see pain. <laughs> they want to see, you know... You know, they want to see someone punished for the bad that they've done. And especially now, race is such a heightened issue with the Trayvon Martin trial. I know we're going to be talking about Talk about in that. a little bit. But it's just such a, a deep issue that we tend to kind of rush around the surface and we never go deep enough to dig into the wound, try to find the healing salve if we could, and then really offer up, you know, solutions before we sew it back up. We tend to sew it back up with the infection still in there every time somebody makes one of these kind of comments. <laughs> Well, and just with our last remaining moments here, Reynard, uh, we know Paula really is working, and she will try to work on repairing her image. Uh, she's going to try to make peace with the public. So what are some of the steps that she could or should take uh, in providing, if we could say, racial reconciliation? What would you think she should do? Okay, now you want me to tell you what I think she should or what she's going to do? Uh, both would be helpful. Okay, number one, and I find this very insulting. So typically when a white person gets caught in a situation like this, they will go find a prominent black person, in this case Jesse Jackson. She's going to pay him six figures personally as well as to one of his um, political organizations. Jesse's going to hold a press conference and say, I vouch for her, and then it's going to disappear. I find it quite offensive because the Jewish community will never allow that to happen. They will make you grovel before them, and, and money's not even an issue. They want to make sure you have truly had a change of heart before they even consider embracing you publicly for the road, down, the walk down the road of redemption. But whenever we get in trouble, the white offender throw some money. Ines did the same thing with the Rutgers girl. Uh, remember when Denny's, when they wouldn't serve the Secret Service agent, so Denny's promised to, to give black franchisees to Denny's and minority supplier programs and all that stuff. We are so undervalued and disrespected that people know they can insult us, throw a check at us, and everything is okay. And I find that quite offensive and more offensive for the blacks who get involved and get the payoff and then think they have the unilateral power to tell the black community, okay, now they're cool people now. Mm. So what do you think she's, uh, you think that's what you're, she's going to do, pay Jesse? No, no, and she's already doing that. So, yeah, that's she's what she's going to do. Now, what she should be doing is shut her mouth, disappear, just keep her nose to grindstone, whatever business interest she has, she just needs to focus on that, do no more media interviews, do no more public statements, but just continue to do what she's doing, whatever corporate relations she still has as far as endorsement deal, just work quietly on that, but all this public groveling and stuff, shut up, disappear for a year or two, get your act together, and see where the public mood is at that point. That's what she should do from a PR perspective. But there's nothing she can say in the immediacy of this incident that's going to make her any better off than she is now. Well, we have heard here uh, from some of the great voices in, uh, in Media Land regarding the, the uh, Paula Dean story. So we're going to be back in a moment. Continue to deal with racism. Is it dead?
I think sometimes we spend more time planning our next vacation than we do thinking about where we'll spend the rest of eternity. This is Jim Garlow with The Garlow Perspective. It's surprising how many people's perception of heaven and hell come from the media or a television series. It amazes me. People go to Paris for one week and they'll go online and they'll buy brochures and maps and study and they'll know all about Paris before they get there. But if they're going to go to heaven forever, they seem to know almost nothing about it. And the conventional view is, well, I know I'm going to go there, so what do I have to worry about it anyway? What kind of thinking is that? On top of that, we think of how little sermons we hear about heaven or hell or how many classes are in seminaries and Bible college about the topic. The Bible's got a lot to say about it. Are we possibly too absorbed with the here and now, just too existential, too consumed with right now, not enough to be consumed with the reality of eternity? We need an eternal perspective. We live in a pretty chaotic world these days. But Dr. Tony Evans says that some of that disorder is related to our disobedience. He explains as he brings us the alternative view. There is another kind of terrorism that you need to be aware of. And you know it's terrorism because so many people's lives are in disarray. Chaos. Many of us wake up to chaos and go to bed to chaos. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you, verse 3, to understand that Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of a woman, and uh, God is the head of Christ. What God lays out here, like it or not, is an order. The way he wants his kingdom to function. Christ, it says, is the head of every man. One of the reasons we have chaos today is because we do not have a generation of men who are under authority. 1 Samuel 15 says, when this rebellion occurs, it is witchcraft. This rebellion started with the devil. Once a man takes the position, Jesus Christ is not going to tell me what to do, he flips kingdoms and has now joined a terrorist organization. You become one of the angels that the devil stole from God. There's a battle going on behind the scenes of our lives, and what you choose to do about it may decide whether you wind up as a victor or a victim. Learn more in the booklet Tony Evans Speaks Out on Spiritual Warfare. Ask for details when you call us at 1-800-800-3222 or log on to TonyEvans.org. You've been listening to The Alternative View. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show, and we're here in the studio with Pastor Matt Anderson, and on the line is Raynard Jackson. We're dealing with the issue, is racism dead? And uh, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court right now in affirmative action. So, Raynard, we'll start with you uh, on these series of questions. Last week, uh, as we know, we heard in the news, Supreme Court ruled on several major cases, but One of those cases, affirmative action, seemed to get buried, buried, buried in the media. (laughs) So tell us and tell our listeners what really happened uh, and and help us understand that a little bit, if you could unpack that. Yeah, well, again, I have a somewhat different take on this the two Supreme Court cases, Affirmative Action and the Voting Rights Act, and in my column that's coming out tomorrow, I'll discuss these two cases. But on the Affirmative Action case, black folks, as usual, have lost their mind on the decision. Anytime you talk about even visiting anything from the civil rights era as far as legislation and policy, we tend to lose our minds and get emotional at that to the point where we become irrational. What the Supreme Court basically said, they upheld the legality of our of affirmative action. What they said was they 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 subjected it to what we call a, a high level of scrutiny. And what that means is they said affirmative action is still okay. But you got to show the court and you and you as a university, you have to show that you have used every other possibility to create a diverse environment on your campus before you use race. So if, if you've tried everything else and you can prove it to us, 
it's okay to use race as a factor. So they didn't overturn affirmative action. They just kind of made it a more narrowly focused application within the admissions process. So they still support it, but the university has to make sure they go to race as a last resort as far as consideration into the admission process. That's what they said. All right. Well, Matt, so what is this race-conscious admission here at, at the university? Can a white student, and that we know that's the issue, can a white student be rejected from a school for a minority student of equal education standing? Well, should that's they? That's illegal no. anyway. So to me, that's a red herring there, and I'll let Matt get to it. If you want, I'll comment after Matt, but that's it. That, it's illegal to do that anyway. Yeah, I agree with him. Uh, I agree with you, Reynard. Um, definitely. Um, I, I think that should it be this way? No. Uh, is it that way? Obviously, because she just brought this, you know, Supreme Court case. You know, Abigail Fisher, a high school student in Texas, said, look, I want to get into school. I can't get into school. They're actually letting in uh, a, a quota of so many African-Americans who are less qualified than I. So she brought the case. So if we want to be judged by the content of our character or the performance of our skills, and we want to be, you know, uh, evaluated equally, then, you know, I think the initial reason for affirmative action was honorable, and I think it still is honorable. We're finding out to this very day that race is still alive and well when it comes to institutionalized racism, uh, racism whether it is an educational process or whether it's in uh, employment opportunities or whether it's in housing. And we even, of course, uh, as Raynard touched on, even the, in the voting rights uh, situation where we're starting to see more of this redlining going on, where the redistricting and these kinds of things uh, and those kinds of things are going to begin to hurt uh, minorities as well. But, you know, it's as long as we still have these challenges, I see that they're beginning to pave the way for the doing away with affirmative action. Uh, after all, we've got an African-American president, some say. We've got an African-American, uh, you know, we had an African-American woman, Secretary of State, and before that, an African-American man, Secretary of State. You know, the Attorney General's black. I mean, after all, Come on, you guys have you know moved up to the deluxe apartment in the sky. That's right. <laughs> so they have arrived right. in society, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and and but, so but, we but, still have these outdated me, provisions. But go ahead, Raynard. Let me get, let me add this. Let's talk about Abigail Fisher for one one minute. And, and I mentioned this in my call. Abigail Fisher is from Sugarland, Texas, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs in the country, as well as one of the wealthiest and and it's outside of Houston, Texas. Her pleading, in, in her actual pleading it with the Supreme Court document, she's an 18-year-old white girl. She applied to the uni University of Texas at Austin, was rejected for admission. She automatically assumes, because she grows up in a wealthy suburb, suburb of Houston, if she didn't get what she wanted, it could be because someone was more qualified. It had to be some daggone minority was given something they didn't earn. And number one, number two, she has no way of knowing that because admissions applications are confidential. So she assumes she is the definition of white privilege personified in this case. And so you know what, what's interesting in one of the briefs in the Supreme Court? The school actually submitted, even if affirmative action was not applicable here, she would not have been admitted. You know why? Because George Bush, when he was governor of Texas, to get around the Supreme Court uh, tinkering with affirmative action, what he said, okay, since I can't use race into consideration, the top 10% of students in any school in Texas, any, will get automatic admissions into the University of Texas school system. She was in the top 12% of her school. So this whole notion about her slot was given to a minority, if a minority anywhere in Texas was within the top 10% of their graduating class, they got automatic admission. It had nothing to do with race. She missed the cut by two percentage points. She was not qualified, and no one's talking about that. Mm. The, the insight of that is important. So, so Matt, uh, we already know that people's race are being considered, uh, for application, do you think that universities still need to weigh a person's race uh, when they're considering this application admission? Ab absolutely, because race is directly tied to socioeconomic conditions. Uh, and we, we can see, by and large, that the prison uh, population is comprised of more than 51 percent of African Americans, or roughly, depending upon what state you're in. But by and large, it's close to 50 percent uh, here in the country is African American, yet 
we're only 13, maybe 14 percent of the overall population. So we're disproportionately locked up, locked out. And, and we're I, I think we really have to consider it to some degree. But I, I think the Supreme Court is onto something when they say, you know, there have been some people who have tended tended to abuse it. But at the same time, I, I can speak for myself. Uh, I've been in employed at places where I've been one out of 20 people in my department. I'm the only African-American and everyone else in my department is is white. And I'm like, how did that happen? Aren't there other African-Americans or Latinos or even Asians who could perhaps do the same job and reach the same uh, uh, group of people, reach our same customer base? It, it just was amazing to me when I walked into a room the first time I was at this particular job and, and that happened. I was like, wow, I, I'd been disconnected for that long because I had worked in predominantly African-American uh, owned companies and serving an African-American audience. And when I found myself in a broader market uh, corporation, I was like, wow, okay, this stuff is still real. And we talked about this off air earlier where we joked about it. Did you, did I think that I was part of that affirmative action process where I've got to be a quota? And I remember being in a management position before where I actually had to hire people or at least interview enough people of different backgrounds, of, of whether it was uh, women, uh, uh, disabled persons, uh, Older persons, of course, every race we had to interview, and we had to interview anywhere between five and eight people just to make sure we had documentation for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So we had that file uh, in place. So when we did hire someone, we had some backup ammunition to say, yes, we did go through the process, and the person who got the job was the most qualified for it. So I think we still do need affirmative action to some degree, at least to consider people to get into uh, uh, higher education, because education, I found, is directly connected to uh, economic opportunities. Mm. Well, Raynard, this is our last question that we're going to ask regarding the Supreme Court before we move on to Trayvon Martin trials. But uh, what do the universities really gain by having a multicultural, multiracial campus? Well, I mean, walk down any street USA and you see we are the most diverse country in the world. And if you can't navigate between black, white, Hispanic, Asian, then you're at a competitive disadvantage, not only as far as employment opportunities, just, but just in being able to navigate socially in this multicultural world. I mean, we are in a global society, and I'm amazed as we migrate into Trayvon Martin. Now, isn't it amazing that this girl, um, Rachel Chantal, the key witness last week, it's amazing that especially white media and even a lot of black folks are saying they were embarrassed by her and she's dumb and et cetera, et cetera. But I find it quite intriguing that you have a woman who speaks four languages and she's supposed to be dumb. Most Americans can barely speak one language. <laughs> I'm amazed at that. I'm amazed at that. Now, does she present herself in the manner that most of us know? But can you survive in her world for one day? Let's turn the question around. Hmm. Can you survive in the world she lives in, 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 in Miami? I've been with where she lives. I know that community. And most of these folks who are criticizing her wouldn't last one day. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this very explosive uh, topic. And, and if you could continue talking about that for a moment, we understand the Trayvon Martin trial. It's already underway in Florida. We saw it last week on the news. Uh, there probably isn't a soul who's listening right here today who hasn't heard of this. But, but Reynard, if you would please take us back to the day you heard of the shooting. And uh, what do you think of Trayvon's death? Yeah, well, number one, it should have never happened because Zimmerman you're talking about white privilege, I, and I don't want to get off on this bull crap. Of, oh, well, he's Latino. I don't care. It's the, the notion that you can look at someone and say, in, to, in your own mind, well, he doesn't fit this picture here. Why is he in my neighborhood? Why is he walking down my street? Why is he just hanging around? Is something wrong with this? To me, that's the issue right there. How can you look at someone who's not breaking any laws, but he's merely walking down the street, and you are arrogant enough to say he does not fit the profile for people who live in my neighborhood. Now, if he is truly Hispanic, you would have thought he would be a lot more sensitive to that issue because, you know what, a lot of Hispanics have been profiled like that. And this is the definition of racial profile. I don't care what the ethnicity is. The mere fact he looked at someone he didn't recognize and thought they were supposed to answer to him 
And he had no legal right to accost him and ask him, why are you here? You are a police, you are a neighborhood watchman. You do not have uh, enforcement uh, powers because you are a neighborhood watch. So this was a typical case of someone who thought that he could determine who was appropriate and who was not to be in my neighborhood. I go through that now because I stay in a lot of, uh, you know, let's say, well-to-do neighbors. I'm driving around. People are like, why you? Well, I live here. Is there a problem? Mm, right. Oh, oh well, 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 we didn't mean to. No, you looked at me and said I didn't fit the profile of people who live in this neighborhood. So, so Matt, and thank you for uh, sharing that. Matt, do you feel you've watched the trial? We know you've been watching this on television, all the news reports. Uh, that shooting. Do you think this really was a racially motivated killing? Well, that's, <clears throat> that is a, a tough question because, first off, you know, listening to the trial, I, it was raining. Uh, he had a hood on. Uh, was he acting strange? He could have been. He had, he had earbuds on. He had headphones on. He was talking to a girl. So you remember being, you know, 17, talking to a girl with Skittles and a drink, and you're trying to get back to the house, and you're at your dad's house. And, you know, you're away from the, the confines of your mom's rules, and now you think you have a little bit more freedom with your dad now. So he's just trying to, he's being a kid. He's doing what kids do. Now we have this other guy who wants to be a cop but is not able to, you know, pass all the, the requirements, you know, to, to uh, be able to become a police officer. So he may have been a little bit overzealous. Race, listening to all the other phone calls that came into, you know, the non-emergency number there at 911 during the case, he identified every single suspect. Perhaps there were others, but everyone that they played during the trial said African American or black. So, the, were there no other people there that he found that could have been suspicious or fitted fit the suspicious profile? Uh, the trial made me think about my sons at the time. You know, they were close to that to that age when it first happened. Well, you know, they're twenty one and twenty five, but not much. You know, older. And I think about the size of him. You know, he's not a big guy. You know, one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty pounds, maybe six feet tall. He's pretty skinny. But he could be, held, you know, pretty strong. Uh, did, did it require, you know, deadly force? Absolutely not. I don't think so. You know, learn how to fight. I mean, if you were studying MMA, that's what they just said. He was studying MMA. He was losing. So uh, based on the testimony right now. So, you know, I, I think this really does speak to the broader issue about being uh, walking onto an elevator and, pe you know, people clutching their purse, people crossing to the other side of the street when they see someone who's considered uh, a menace to society, a young black male, tends to still be uh, identified as public enemy number one. So I'm glad at least we're talking about this because it is essential. Agreed. It, it is. So, so Reynard, going back to the media uh, field, do you think they've handled this? And, and we've only got another moment or so. Do you think the media has handled this incident appropriately, or are they really trying to fan the flames of this racial divide? The media, it, media wants to focus on the salaciousness, murder. Uh, they want to focus on any kind of, you know, lewd photos of Trayvon's body being re revealed in the public. And they don't care about the fact the media has become a bit player. That was the time that journalists actually reported the facts and reported the news. Now the media has become part of the story, and that is very hypocritical, and it's against the whole whole. whole journalistic creed. So they're a bunch of hypocrites. They want to drive ratings. That's their only, and they don't care about a person being dead. They could care less about that. Well, Matt, just 30 seconds here. Do you think the church is really handling racism well? God looks at the heart while man looks at the outward appearance. If we can get to the place where we can hear one another's heart, which starts with dialogue, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we need to have dialogue. We need to have conversation around the issue of race uh, so we can begin to heal. Well, this is The Harry Jackson Show, and we thank you for stay tuning in today. Stay tuned tomorrow. We'll see you then.